everyone. Happy longest day of the year. At least if you're in the Northern Hemisphere like we are. Earlier this month on June 5th, TechBuzz hosted a really interesting webinar on the topic of China AI. My co-host, Ray Ma, spoke with Jeff Ding. Jeff is a researcher at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University, and he's also the creator of a popular weekly newsletter called China AI, which you can find and subscribe to for free at ChinaAI, that's one A, dot substack, dot com. What follows is a lightly edited recording of Jeff's presentation. A quick reminder to visit us online at techbuzzchina.com, where you can sign up to be on our mailing list, subscribe to our bi-weekly paid Extra Buzz newsletter, or just generally keep tabs on our ventures beyond podcasting. For example, we're working on an ebook on the most talked about Chinese internet company this year, ByteDance, creator of TikTok, and just published our second annotated transcript of an interview with the CEO Zhang Yiming. It's from 2018, but I really suggest you take a read. It's really interesting. As we mentioned in the last couple of episodes, we are taking a break from our regular programming for another couple of episodes, and in the meantime, we're experimenting with new formats like this one. Definitely, let us know your feedback. And if you miss our voices, don't worry. We've been pretty visible being guests on other podcasts. I was just on the Use Case podcast, for example, with Ravish Bhatia. It's a show that generally explores the startup world in India, but he kindly made an exception for us because I think there's genuine interest from Indian entrepreneurs and listeners. But also, Chinese internet companies have just been relentlessly pursuing expansion there. Definitely check out the show and the episode. The president's key economic team goes to China.、Uh, after whole night thinking, I say I still want to do it. Hi everyone. We are Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily, powered by the Sinica Podcast Network by Sub China. We are a biweekly podcast focused on giving you a peek into what's buzzing within the tech community in China. We uncover and contextualize unique insights, perspectives, and takeaways on headline tech news that don't always make it into English language coverage, so you can be smarter about the world of China tech. Tech Buzz China is a part of Handaily dot com, an English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Rayma, and I'm your other co-host, Ying Lu. We are a part of the Sinica Podcast Network, created by Sub China. In addition to Tech Buzz, you can also find Sinica, which covers current affairs. And we are also proud to be partnered with Financial Times's Tech Scroll Asia. It's a newsletter on Asia tech news from one of the best publications in the business. Go to ft.com forward slash tech dash scroll dash Asia to sign up today. And as always, we're still looking for more reviews on Apple Podcasts. Send us a screenshot of your review, and yes, past ones count as well. And we will gift you a free three-month subscription to our Extra Buzz newsletter. Just email us at rui at techbuzzchina dot com. Thank you so much for those of you who've already taken advantage of the offer. I hope you're enjoying your newsletter. So, hey guys, today we will be focusing on AI in China, specifically some of the very unsexy but true facts about the industry, and also a list of things that you didn't know but probably should about the topic. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this session, Jeff Ding, who's prepared a whole presentation on the subject. I've never actually met Jeff in person, just over Zoom, but that's because most of the time he is in Oxford, where he's currently finishing up his PhD as a Rhodes Scholar, as well as working as China Lead for the Center of Governance of AI at the Future of Humanity Institute. 
Jeff is one of my favorite people to follow on China AI, and I find that he's one of the most thoughtful thinkers on it. For our listeners on the podcast, you're not going to be able to see his presentation, but we've made sure that you will be able to follow along just by listening. However, you can still also find a recording of this session on YouTube as well by going to the Tech Buzz China YouTube channel. So, without further ado, here we have Jeff Ding. Thank you, Ray. I'm yeah, I'm a fan of the Tech Buzz China podcast. I like to kind of just put it on for a run. It's like a nice bite-sized, twenty, thirty-minute thing, and I like how they make it like really light and digestible. But also, there's like a lot of information. So I was listening to the Bite Dance one yesterday. So yeah, it's exciting to be here. Yeah, basically. I'm flexible in terms of how we do this. I have a bunch of slides. The first five are just going to be about what I call unsexy China AI, and basically just looking at the companies that aren't often covered in the Western news media or aren't as flashy or visible consumer companies. And it also involves what's happening in cities outside of the first tier cities. So, what's happening in cities outside of Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Shanghai, and then the. I have a bunch of other slides where I give like the standard kind of like ten thoughts I have about China's AI development policymakers, like in DC. Awesome. Let's dive in then. So this is slightly blurry, but this is from a previous China AI translation. It's from a media platform called Layphone.、Uh, the English is Layphone. It's one of the kind of the sites that I constantly follow.、Um, I subscribe to. It's one of the subscribed accounts on like the list of WeChat public accounts. And they regularly pump out information on China's tech scene, smart industry. I loosely call them the MIT Tech Review of China. They regularly pump out really high quality articles on China's AI scene, and they did ranking of kind of the best future AI companies, or you know, the AI companies with the most growth potential. And you can see the list of these companies, I and mean, it gives you a good sense of the diversity of the scene. So you have the strong tech giants, like you you see Huawei in kind of the row. Of AI security and under the column of best fortified growth, so Huawei tech giants are up there. There are branches of tech giants on there. You have the standard big four facial recognition companies. So if you look at the AI and medicine row with the product growth vertical, you have E2's precision medicine app, and then you have other well-known startups that have been covered, like Squirrel AI. Momenta is a strong computer vision company in AI and cars and commercial growth. So some of these names are standard. Some of the names that stuck out, CloudWalk,、uh, I covered in the recent issue of China AI. That's also one of the big four computer vision startups. Some of the names are less standard. So one that stood out to me was just Ultra Power. I've never heard of them before, and they are one of the few that appeared twice. Right, the best in future growth, both in 2018 and 2019. Shenzhou Taiyue, I think, is how you pronounce that. So. Uh, why is this company interesting? Well, first of all, it's been around for 20 years, so it's one of these long-standing companies. It probably has a lot of good relationships with the government. It's worked closely with China Mobile before in the past. I think they developed one of the first IM messaging apps. But what's more interesting about this company is it's doing something that's not going to like make headlines. It's not like some cool face swapping app or like deep fake thing, but it's doing like a lot of the back-end enterprise processing, which is going to be, I think, one of the big areas where AI is going to make. Increases on productivity. So stuff like building、uh, natural language processing NLP banks, fa NLP factories for companies to like better streamline、um, how they manage all their operations, how to make smarter the processes behind software updates. Very unsexy stuff, but just like coordinating everything that happens in a company better and more efficient. That is a lot of what. Uh, Ultra Power does. I think like these types of companies. Other ones that I've covered、uh, include State Grid, which is a state-owned company, one of the biggest in China. They actually are number one in terms of like the patents that they file in AI. Now, some of this is like inflated because、um, there's different incentives for state-owned companies to file patents. But and I would still say like some of the more well-known startups probably have better technical capabilities. But something like State Grid is going to be at that kind of like second order. Or who is adopting and then specializing some of these more general AI algorithms for specific applications, like State Grid, in terms of like flexible energy grid management. The other aspect of unsexy AI is, I think, like making knives better is really, really interesting, and I think it's one of the it's a it's a really key application of AI in China,、um, especially if you look at the July 2017 plan. This was part of my deciphering China's AI dream report. Uh, if you look at the language carefully, a lot of people, including myself, we had trouble translating this. I forget what the exact term was, but it was something. It was something that I translated as gross output,、um, and that's a term that's very much like a manufacturing indicator. 
And there's a heavy emphasis on manufacturing, kind of like economic forces, the driving force behind this like plan. And it's very much rooted in this idea of like trying to escape the middle income track. And one of the key things here is a lot of times when you read Chinese writings on AI, they're not necessarily comparing themselves to the U.S. as much as kind of U.S. media is where everything is wrapped up in like a U.S. China two player game. And in this article from Ji Chi Zhixing, um, which is a really good kind of um, pump, pumping out a lot of good long form articles on the tech scene from their sub platform called Ji Chi Zhinen. You can get like English readouts from their platform synced condensed translations of uh, their work. Uh, but they had this long article on computer vision and machine quality inspection on production lines. And see the quote from the CEO of a small startup that's making this comparison, not, not between the China and US on these areas, but between Germany, South Korea, Switzerland, in terms of like making stuff like this knife better. In this article, it says that in these production lines of just something as simple as making a knife, um, like 20 to 30 percent of the human capital is spent on just like inspecting the knife for defects as it goes through the production chain. And that's what Shu Zhilian comes in. It's basically just saying that um, can we apply computer vision to improve our ability to get China to a higher level of efficiency in manufacturing? And so that's a very clear example of where you're actually getting to productivity growth. I think that's important. We talk about facial recognition, but I don't, it's definitely important. It's going to be spread across a lot of verticals, but where is the actual impact on productivity growth, which is the key driver of long-term economic growth. So I think this sort of stuff is, is also really important. And last thing about kind of unsexy AI is, can we talk about things outside of the top four cities? And this was from another earlier translation, but basically they did a ranking of who are the top five cities in terms of demand for computing power. That's a good proxy for like who's running the most, training the most AI algorithms, who's doing inference on the most AI algorithms. And actually the two dark horses that they found were Hefei and Hangzhou, two non-first year cities. And this draws from a report that I contributed to recently by Nesta, where I looked at these two AI ecosystems. And the key part of both of these cities is they have a key anchor tenant tech company. Um, for Hefei, that's iFly Tech. For Hanjo, that's obviously Alibaba. And then they also each have an elite university that glue the ecosystem together. For Hefei, that's University of Science and Technology of China, USTC. And for Hangzhou, that is Zhejiang University. And I think both of those are top 10 universities, kind of like top tier universities. And in each of these cities, there have been consistent local level, provincial level funds to support AI development. For Hefei, they've strategically targeted speech recognition because they're just not going to draw like the global talent that's needed for a comprehensive AI ecosystem. For Hanzhou, they've been able to kind of diversify in a lot of areas because they have more extra regional linkages and they also are able to attract global talent just because it's a better place to live in, high, higher living standards, et cetera. I think what's important here is, I think a lot of times we focus on like, who's gonna build the next Silicon Valley, uh, which is important. And like, we focus on like the Silicon Valleys of China, Zhongguanzun and Beijing. Um, what's, I think what's also important in a lot of these countries that are trying to like develop AI capabilities across the board, and if you think that technological diffusion is important, it's about how do you connect the Silicon Valleys to the Detroits of the world? Um, and how do you have clusters outside of the Silicon Valleys. So these are also developments that I think are interesting. This is the start of my standard presentation of like 10 key points that I talk about when I think about China and AI governance more broadly. So number one is China is now and will remain an indispensable actor in AI governance. I use indispensable reference, uh, Madeleine Albright's term about the U.S. role in the world, which is not the idea that like it consumes everything and that it is the it has to be the policeman of every single sphere of governance, but without it, nothing can really happen. And I think that applies now to China as well. Uh, this is from Mary Meeker's most downloaded slide deck every year, um, where she looks at internet trends. And the top 20 worldwide internet leaders five years ago, you see only two Chinese companies. Today, which I think is 2018, in the context of this slide, you have nine Chinese companies as the top 20 worldwide internet leaders, uh, whereas you just have 11, whereas the rest are U.S. companies. And this is a imperfect but a good metric because a lot of these companies also have AI labs, some of the best AI labs attach them doing fundamental research in this space. And... One of the first areas where AI is applied uh, relatively easily is through internet data, uh, consumer internet data, social networks, uh, recommendation algorithms. 
I think the the argument is we can debate over like how far along China's AI capabilities are, but I think the reason why I stress that uh, China will remain an indispensable actor is even if the capabilities aren't advanced, other countries will prop up Chinese AI capabilities to justify actions in the space. And I think this is an interesting kind of leaked memo about a centralized 5G network and kind of the reasonings behind that, why there's a push to centralize the U.S.'s 5G network was because they were fretting about China's dominance of artificial intelligence. That's kind of like a scene setting case, but that falls on to my next point, which is that Western observers consistently overstate China's AI capabilities. This draws from testimony last summer that I did for the U.S.-China Commission, where my conclusion was basically China is not poised to overtake the U.S. as an AI superpower. And I think that Oftentimes, when we try to measure national AI capabilities, we just don't have a good sense of what we're trying to measure. And it obviously matters for different things. If you're measuring AI capabilities for overall productivity growth, I would be measuring different things than if I were measuring national AI capabilities for who's going to have the most advanced weapon system to be able to apply like autonomous control, right? So then I would use different indicators. What I'm using here is just kind of very broad drivers. I try to separate things out along three cross sections. One is like, what are your scientific and uh, technological inputs and what are your outputs? Some people think outputs are a better measure because you're actually seeing them translated into actual value. Some people say inputs are better because they say you can't capture all the outputs perfectly. So you might as well see like what's being put in, in terms of like how much talent are you investing in? How much R&D spending are you putting in rather than what are your patent and publication counts? And a consistent finding around here is that while China leads in the raw counts, um, if you look, if you control for quality and like how much these uh, publications and patents are cited and forward cited by other people, and if you control for quality, uh, the U.S. is still pretty far ahead, and we're still uncertain about things like R and D spending. Um, another thing you have to divide things by is you have to look at different areas of the value chain. So actually, a lot of、um, Chinese government documents complain about China's lack of foundational AI open source software. So they, I actually translated like a. A whole white paper that they did on this very subject, where they said 66% of AI open source software is developed in the United States, and they view that as like a key weakness. And then finally, I think there are some areas where China is ahead in some subdomains and in some aspects of the value chain. Facial recognition for surveillance is an obvious one, but also you have to make clear distinctions in the space between like Chinese NLP and English NLP. Right, the L in NLP makes a difference in terms of which companies have better capabilities. It, it's obvious that like because Chinese companies have more of a, a demand from Chinese consumers, they would specialize in Chinese NLP. Okay, number three. China is not a monolithic actor, and this distinction is meaningful for key issues in AI governance. Maybe here, I just want to focus on the companies. There's a lot of like disagreements between bureaucratic departments too that I mentioned in my report, deciphering China's AI dream. One of the big ones is like MIIT, which is the Industry Information Technology Ministry, versus Ministry of Science and Technology over who does technology planning. In the Nesta piece, I talk about how like a lot of the outlays on AI planning are coming at the provincial and local government. So those are other important distinctions to make. But I want to focus in on the companies. So there's this concept of like the national team in AI, and a lot of framing of the national team. Guajiatue has been around this outdated notion of national champions, where like governments are directly subsidizing companies or directly own the companies. Whereas a lot of these new national team companies are largely private multinational companies with with international ambitions. They don't just want to compete in the Chinese market. But I think you have to make distinctions. So the first batch of national Team companies, batch of four companies. It was the BAT companies and iFly Tech. And iFly Tech is interesting in that of the first batch of national team companies, it was definitely the most national. They rely heavily on government subsidies. They were born out of, I believe, USTC, the university I mentioned earlier, and that is a university with very strong connections to the state. Why does this matter? Which company is more national? Well, with kind of the increase in techno nationalism, the increase in ensuring data security, and tying the increasing linkage between technological issues and national security issues, I think that there is a trend towards, at least on the part of the Chinese government, wanting to indigenize innovation, maintain critical inf- information infrastructure. Within the scope of domestically invested companies, and you see some of those dynamics play out as well in terms of like which companies are invited to set technical standards in the space. And yeah, I think like there's a reason why SenseTime very quickly like moved one of their headquarters to Beijing, right? They're originally like a Hong Kong company, but 
but I think there's a lot of incentives for sense time for one of the big facial recognition startups to be a Chinese company. And you see these distinctions among even like the four uh, computer vision startups now. So the recent issue of China AI focused on Cloudwalk, which is one of the four. You have Cloudwalk, E2, which we mentioned before, SenseTime, and MegV. And this article made the argument that of all these four, Cloudwalk is the most national. And they analyze this based off of like where they're getting their funding from. Are they getting their funding from state funds or are they getting them from like overseas VCs? And Cloudwalk is getting a lot of their funding from state funds. And then also, where do you list, right? MegV tried uh, or was exploring listing on Hong Kong, which is kind of in the middle ground. Whereas there's rumors that like Cloudwalk wants to list on this new star exchange, which is uh, kind of like a science and technology specific market off of the Shanghai exchange that's trying to incentivize sort of like these companies to provide domestic investors. Yeah, I mentioned technical standards. I just like this example because it shows even Chinese companies that are supposedly more aligned with the state will also fight with each other. So technical standards has a lot of cross-cutting cleavages and Chinese companies will often ally with their strategic partners, international companies to vote against standards pushed by other Chinese companies, which was the case with this example of Lenovo and Huawei, where Huawei, Lenovo voted against a Huawei proposal. Number four, uh, China is not an impermeable national container and this distinction is meaningful for key issues in AI governance. I like to give this example of Xef Research Asia uh, as one of the key cultivation training grounds of China's AI scene. You have 500 plus like key employees of different big tech companies, um, AI startups that spent time in Microsoft Research Asia. There's a famous ResNets paper. It's one of the key innovations, uh, one of the fundamental advances in AI. It was used in, I believe, AlphaGo. So it's a, it's a way to just like layer a bunch of neural networks together. But it's interesting to see where the four co-authors end up, right? One of the co-authors, Kai Minghe, he's now one of the lead developers at Facebook AI. So this is like a very uh, technical, techno-global example, right? Global flow of talent, a lot of talented Chinese AI researchers who work at Microsoft Research Asia eventually help Microsoft or help Facebook or come and like work for Snapchat. But also th three of the others went and started their own um, computer vision startups, uh, Momenta, Megvi, Face++. We've mentioned some of these companies before. Hopefully some of the threads are, are tying together here. Also mentioned this point before, so I won't belabor it. Venture and local governments will play an outsized role in implementing AI. And this is the case with overall innovation policy. If you look at like actual outlays of R&D spending, the majority is coming from local and provincial governments, not from the central government. So the impl implementation is also all happening at the local level. And this proportion is only rising. So this is this goes back to the unsexy AI point of what can we look at? Can we look at local AI ecosystems outside of the top tier cities? And digging deeper into the Hanzhou and Hefei case, you had China's Speech Valley, which was a which was designated a national level AI industrial area all the way back in 2012. So this predates the 2017 plan by five years. This investment in AI did not start in July 2017 with the national plan. Um, our attention to it started back then. Hangzhou AI Town is another interesting one. One of the issues with the space is you never know like what's actually happening on the ground and whether funds that are um, announced are actually being spent. What's cool about Hondro AI Town is they actually have a website where I drew on for the Nesta report that I was mentioning, where they actually list, hey, here's all the subsidies we gave and here's all the funding and the specific projects and which companies and how much funding we gave. Um, and it's divided into like office expenses, research expenses, and then a key component is cloud computing expenses, um, right? Because that's important for like training and running AI algorithms. And that third vertical of cloud expenses was really interesting because the provider of all those cloud services, all except for like one project was Alibaba. So it's very clearly just like, like a way um, for kind of Alibaba to anchor the system. But I think they added one Tencent cloud computing. It wasn't all Alibaba cloud services. This stuff is where we have to get to, where we're actually like, we have to get even more detailed than this, but how do you actually get to the level of like a hundred AI town and see what's actually being spent and what those specific projects are happening on the ground. The next three points are just on different drivers of AI development. One of these is hardware. Yeah, just to give you a sense of why hardware is strategic. So I've mentioned training, the difference between training and inference multiple times, and different companies will supply different chips for training and inference. So sense time, for example, world's most valuable AI unicorn. Training comes from NVIDIA, a US company that designs GPUs. And then the inference kind of the end device implementation comes from Qualcomm, another US company, which is why you're seeing a compute targeted as a strategic asset in some of these discussions now. But even the US is not completely independent in 
hardware, right? So I mentioned, I specified that NVIDIA is a design, chip design company. They have a partnership with TSMC to actually manufacture and fabricate the chips. And those are based in Taiwan and that's based in Taiwan. So, and even that global foundries, that number two on that chart, which is described as a US company, that's like, I think controlled by a UAE state investment fund. So you start to see some of these like uh, complicated cross-cutting cleavages and linkages in the space. Talent is another key driver. There's a three-part takeaway here, and I think it holds true, although I need to update the data, but the three parts are part one, while China's researchers are climbing the ranks of international AI competitions and conferences, B, they are still not publishing the best of the best fundamental AI research, C, though this could change given China's huge base of talent. Um, so this is something we did with, I did with Micro Polo and uh, Matt Sheehan and Joy Ma and using a nice database called CS rankings where you can, where I think it's better than like citation counts because it's just looking at publication counts in top conference venues. So there's no like citation rigging that can happen. And it's just like your academics publishing in the top three conferences. And here's the trend from 2013 to 2017. You see a clear increase in some of these Chinese universities. The B sub point to this is the best of the best fundamental AI research is still at US institutions largely. And this is looking at specifically NIPS, which is just been renamed NeurIPS. And that is like the top level forum for a lot of the fundamental research. And you can see that a lot of the list is dominated by U.S. companies. And the first Chinese entity that pops up is Tsinghua University at 22, I believe. But the CISA point is that this could change given China's huge base of talent. So if you look at those New Europe's papers that we just looked at, and you dig deeper into one of the actual authors, because those that data from the previous slide about affiliations was just scraped based off of just the affiliation of the paper authors. But then if you look at like where these authors went for undergrad, that kind of gives you a rough proxy of where they're from. Or at the very least, like if they went to undergrad in China, there may be more likelihood that they could eventually go back to China or they have choice to like work in different places to pretty vibrant AI ecosystems. So China does have this like larger base where this paper number 19 on ternary gradients to reduce communication and distributed deep learning is coded in the data set before as uh, U.S., as people who represent U.S. AI talent. But again, this is a technical global cross-cutting landscape, and this represents a lot of researchers who uh, China views as part of their huge base. Cold War arms race analogies do not translate to U.S.-China competition AI. I've talked to this about, about this a lot in recent newsletter issues, so I won't give my spiel now, but kind of like my year two in review was basically all talking about how I think this meme of, I call it a glorified dick measuring contest in terms of who gets technological dominance in AI. Basically, I think there has to, we have to talk about more things besides who has more AI between the US and China. There are other countries in the world that exist and China obviously views this as not just a two player game. Talked about this, economic benefits are the primary driving force. I, I, that's my opinion. I think um, general purpose technologies like AI historically have the most fundamental impacts have come through the economic realm. And then eventually they may have sh shaped military affairs. And then eventually they also shaped social governance. But there's just so many different applications with the general purpose technology that the economic incentives are too great. And I think economic drivers are, a, if you look at that as the central driving force that helps you unlock a lot of different things. Jeff, to wrap up, a question I have is, what are some topics you think aren't covered enough in the English language speaking side that you wish were covered more? Or maybe narratives that frustrate you? I think we both have many of those. Another way to apply this is look at where all the dominant narratives are hurting people to go. So one dominant trajectory right now is to view everything that happens with respect to China's development through the lens of who's going to gain technological dominance, US or China. Right. There was a great Bloomberg article this morning about how the whole China's whole new infrastructure push, which is like a really important concept, new infrastructure. There's some real money behind it. But the headline is China's new effort to steal the crown jewel of technology from the U.S. Whereas like there's a lot wrapped up in the new infrastructure push. that's not about competing with the U.S. Um, it, you know, there's a lot about mm, is this a stimulus amid like COVID? Is this an effort to like protect critical information infrastructure? Um, so just like look for things that go outside of the where the dominant trajectories are going. And I think that's like a way to have this idea of like information arbitrage that, I'm, that I've been trying to push. Yes, well, thanks to efforts like yours. We do a lot of that too at TechBus. If you look at our transcripts, we're primarily citing Chinese analysis. Thanks again, Jeff.
Well, that was the end of our session with Jeff. What did you think about what he had to say? Send us your feedback. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to write us that review for your free Extra Buzz subscription. Have any questions? Email us. We really enjoyed putting this together, and we are always open to any comments or suggestions. You can find us on Twitter at the Pandaily at TechBuzzChina, and my personal Twitter account is spelled R U I M A. And my Twitter is now spelled Y I N G L U two zero two zero. Tech Buzz China by Pandaily is powered by the Seneca Podcast Network on Sub China. Pandaily dot com is an English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. Our producers are Tsai Wei Chen and Kaiser Guo. Thank you for listening.